Today is July the 22nd, 2004, and my name is Johnny Davis. I will be acting as interviewer as we talk to veterans of World War II about some of the experiences they had while serving in the armed forces. This interview is taking place at the Sarah Hightower Library in Rome, Georgia. Handling the video and audio is Randy Allen, the Information Technological Coordinator for Sarah Hightower Library. We're going to ask uh, Eugene Hunsickler, better known as Gene, uh, to tell us about some of his life and about some of his experiences. Mr. Hunsickler, why don't you tell us a little, about, a little bit about your early life and, the, and your family and how you happened to be in the, the mm -hmm. Army Air Corps uh, and some of your experiences while you were in the Air Corps. <clears throat> I was born in Pennsylvania, 1914, little town called Coatesville, the home of Luke and Steel Company. Played, uh, graduated from high school, 1932, and that was right in the heart of the Depression. There were no jobs in Coatesville or any place else. After Roosevelt became elected in 1933, I got a job at Lucan Steel Company in the local storeroom getting 38 cents an hour. Wow. Every two weeks, I had $27. Well, I needed 30, so after a year of that steel room deal, I joined the Army Air Corps with my buddy, Alec Musica. He also had worked at Lucan's. They sent me to Philadelphia, from Philadelphia to, the, uh, to Langley Field, Virginia. We rode the, the, the night boat down from Baltimore to uh, Old Point Comfort. I stayed at Langley Field a year and a half. It was the worst place I ever was. They hated us. They hadn't gotten over the Civil War. And the cops, we were bait for the cops every time we went to town. So I finally got assigned to Texas, Randolph Field, the West Point of the Air, which was the best field we ever had and the best base I was ever at and the best squadron I was ever in the 52nd School Squadron. 1940, I was sent to Hickam Field, Hawaii. I was there until June 1942, and then July we shipped down to the South Pacific after we were hit by the Japs. Okay, Gene, let me interrupt you here just a little bit, and we want to talk a little bit about your experiences uh, especially on December the 7th, 1941. And I would like for you to also talk to us a little bit about, you were talk, uh, telling me about the uh, uh, way we were equipped then or were not equipped. You were talking about down in Texas, the aren't while you were there, that the Army was still, uh, the cavalry was still riding horses. That's right, like. they were. <laughs> <clears throat> well, the... Uh, Let's see, let me get back on this, uh, some of my experiences. <clears throat> well, I, as I said, I hated Langley Field because they hadn't gotten over the Civil War, so when I got into Texas at Randolph Field, I was right at home. Uh, they, they had a uh, 52nd School Squadron in over in Church, Texas, right outside of the uh, base. We used to go over and see Howard. Howard Snyder had a little bar. And we walked across the field at night, and he would bring us home in his old <clears throat> Chevy. And then at, at the 52nd, we had lots of baseball, basketball, football, and hard work. We had BT-9s. It was the uh, basic training one of the basic training fields for the Army Air Corps in those days. They flew in the morning and they flew at nights because the afternoons were too hot, 110 degrees sometimes. And sometimes we got caught in that, we had to cut the grass 
<coughs> and our major had a chicken farm. We had a chicken farm in the 52nd School Squadron. And the 53rd, they had a pig farm at Kelly Field. So we were well equipped for every little bit of everything. And we'd catch our chicken field house detail every once in a while, and it was a mess. Okay. Um, now, the equipment and all that you had, what, what type of uh, fighter planes did we, we had, have? We had BT-9s, North American BT-9, basic training, uh, two-place job, single wing. That's what we had. And the, uh, the primary training was over on the other side of the field. The 53rd Squadron had them. And the, the, uh, the pilots, uh, there was a training for the Air Force cadets. It was the only cadet place there was in those days. And uh, the, the uh, instructors would take us on hops and take us on trips uh, in between uh, uh, flight training. And uh, they were all great people. They would even try to teach you how to fly when nobody was looking. <laughs> so uh, we had a real good, and it was the only good place I ever was. Okay. Uh, well, let's set, the, let's set the stage there for December the 7th, 1941. And, of course, Hickam Field was one of the major uh, targets for the Japanese on their surprise attack on Pearl right. Harbor. We, we, were hit at, we were hit about, they said, about 10 minutes of 8 on mm -hmm. Sunday morning, and previous to that, we had been on a semi-alert from September through the 1st of December. The 1st of December, the alert was called off. Uh, we had the people from Schofield down there with machine guns and all over the place and everything for a couple of months. The 1st of December, we had nothing. And uh, that was it. And of course, after being restricted to the base for a couple of months, Saturday night we all went to town. And that was that was the way it was. Went to Waikiki and started at the Waikiki Tavern, the South Seas, right across the street, right on up till we made it back to the YMCA, and that's where we loaded the taxis and took us back to the base. Okay. And the MPs were there, they, they had clubs, and they'd tap each one of them on the leg for thought, thinking we might be bringing back a bottle of booze. And then they were all big guys, too, I'm six sure foot that two, six happen. foot three. So they were our enemy at the gate. Okay. So you were actually on base there uh, on Hickam Field uh, that Sunday morning when the Japanese attacked. Yes. Uh, what happened, uh, we, they had just completed building a bunch of uh, quarters on the base for a married couple. Well, back in those days, uh, I was a staff sergeant and then $72 a month and uh, you, you couldn't get married on that and you didn't want to get married on that. So the commanding general moved uh, all the first three graders into these houses that they had just built. They put four of us each in a house. We had the stove, we had the refrigerator. If we wanted anything, we'd call up the PX and they'd send it down. We were living the life of Riley at night. <clears throat> and uh, that was real good. Never had anything like that. We didn't have to live in the big barracks. And uh, Sunday morning we were waiting on, we were waiting on the milkman to come around. We had a milkman that came and dropped us milk. Well, of course, he never made it. The Japs hit us, and the first thing we saw were the dive bombers coming right up out of Pearl Harbor. We were assigned right next to the Marine Corps barracks in Pearl Harbor. And the Marines, they were out there with their Springfields trying to hit the Japs when they come up over the, over the uh, water, uh, over the harbor. Then the next thing we saw was the Arizona. Of course, we didn't know it at that time it was the Arizona, but we saw the, saw the big smoke coming up out of the Arizona. The Oklahoma was upset. It was on its side. And uh, our barracks, the, the Japs went right down the barracks. Uh, they went right down the uh, hangar line the first time and blew the hangars around blew the airplanes apart that were there. 
We had B-17s, we had 14 B-17s coming in from the West Coast that morning. They arrived just in time to, to get in line with the Japs. And they had no guns because the commanding general decided that they'd put the guns in at Hickam Field on their way to the Philippines. So they had no guns and they, they, we had B-17s landing all over the island of Oahu. And after that, after that, uh, the, the second round they came around, we were in the barracks, the, the big new barracks they had just built, it was a new base. And that's when the, the high altitude Japs came over, bombed our barracks, sent us all out the front door, and the bomb never got down to the first floor, so we were all right there. And uh, the Navy always said the Japs couldn't hit a bull in the back with a snow shovel, but they were pretty good. They, they, they took us for a ride. And they kept strafing around the base and <coughs> strafing here and strafing there and every place else. Then they got out of there and that was the end of it. We had two fighter pilots got off at Wheeler Field, P-40s, and they shot down I believe five or six Japs. Previous to that, the commanding general of the Army, General Short, took the... Uh, the P-40s that night at Wheeler Field, that was 20 miles from Hickam, they took the gasoline out of the airplane, out of the tanks, and, and stashed the P-40s up row by row. And so we lost about 40 of them that morning. We had nothing. The few people that got off were down at Haleiwa. That was 10 miles from the base. A Lieutenant Welsh and a Lieutenant... Uh, uh, Thomas, I believe, was, was two of them. They shot down five planes, and if we would have been ready and had our P-40s ready and everything, we would have shot down a lot of Japanese, but it was a hell of a mess, and that's all the way it was. You told me that, well, you mentioned there were 14 B-17s that flew in that morning. Without... 14 blew in. We lost eight of them. Yeah, I was thinking you told me that. Uh... Yes, that's right. We lost <clears throat> eight of them, and... Uh, well, they were already on the ground when they were they shot were, up. Oh, they were trying to get on the trying ground. Trying to get on the they ground. They were coming okay. in the same time the Japs were flying around. Okay. And our people were saying, what in the world, are, what are they? And, of course, uh, the, the, uh, Army was, the, the Army was saying, God, they, they, they're having maneuvers today up in Schofield. Well, they had maneuvers until the Japs came right over their barracks and boom, boom, boom. That was the end of the uh, maneuvers. <laughs> So that's, that took care of that. Uh, I noticed you brought this uh, book in, and we'll, we'll talk about this later on or show it. Uh, but anyway, it's 1942 uh, Hickam Bomber Group. And one of the interesting things is this uh, Army Air Corps emblem uh, that was painted on the wings in the fuselage. And I notice it has a big red uh, symbol on the inside of the red, white, and blue star there, and I think they discontinued using that a little later on for one particular reason, and you might... Well, they didn't... The reason they discontinued using it, that's what the Japs had on there, is a big red <laughs> thing. <laughs> then we had one, one, uh, one plane came... We were right next to the Marine Corps barracks. The, the Marine Corps <coughs> barracks was right across the fence. They had a big fence that went down between... Uh, Hickam and Pearl Harbor. And of course the Marines were out there with those Springfields and uh, and they had the, uh, we had we had several uh, dive bombers came right up out of the harbor, right up over the uh, thing and one Japanese in the back thing stuck his fingers up to his nose at us. Mm. So they, we were uh, just close as close as we got to them. Mm. Mm. And that, uh, that was it. Okay, and you you told me you stayed at Hickam for a while after the attack. I stayed at Hickam until the Battle of Midway. Then our B-17s were at Midway, and they used them on search. We lost two B-17s at Midway, and the uh, the mid uh, the B-17s were used for search. They tried to 
they dropped bombs, but in, back in those days, there was no way. They, they, they didn't do very well with their bombs on the Japanese fleet. But they saw the fleet coming in, and uh, if it wouldn't, hadn't been for the Navy dive bombers, <clears throat> I don't know what would have happened. They could have come right into Hawaii because we had nothing, nothing. Okay, so so they they moved you from Hickam to an island in the South Pacific. To Hickam, they moved. <clears throat> we moved down on the. Uh, they took the ninety. I was in the ninety eighth bomb squadron, B seventeens. They moved us down to the South Pacific, and the B seventeens were used uh, while the Marine Corps, the Marines were in Guadalcanal. They were used for uh, bombing the other Jap islands. And uh, they they were there, and they used them on search missions up to Bougainville and all over the South Pacific, all over that part of the uh, Pacific. You were telling me how easy life was when you were down there on that uh, South Pacific island, how nice the facilities <laughs> were. <laughs> yeah, we moved down there on a shoestring. We had gun. Uh, we moved real good going down. They they left us, put us in a, on one of the American President liners, and we ate in the big dining room just like a bunch of tourists. And we thought, my God, this is something. We didn't know where we were going. We had no idea. We had a few submarine alerts on the way down, and going into Ifadi, that was the first island. There was one sub that was waiting for us, a Japanese sub. Well, we, they turned on the, uh, the alarm, and as they did it, in, in those days, they put you down in the holds way down. And this number 365 destroyer came around there and got that Jap sub. He was, he, they knew the Tokyo Rose had told them we were on our way. And so... Uh, they waited on us, and that was it. They got the sub. Then we moved up to Esperito Santo, which was one of the biggest islands in the Hebrides, and they were in the process of building a runway. Well, they had just about completed the runway. They had knocked a grove of coconut trees out of there, and they didn't have any, uh, they had just, it was a hard, it was a coral runway and the, the people of the powers that be were scared to death that uh, come the rainy season, which started in September, that that uh, Carl wouldn't uh, harden or anything. They didn't, nobody knew anything about anything. And luckily, uh, the, the Carl did harden, and then we finally got the, the metal match in there, and, uh, and we had a good runway. And they, they used our B-17s for search all the way around Bougainville and all those islands in uh, in that in that group, because the Japs kept coming in and we kept going mm. up with our B-17s and dropping bombs on them. When they came down through the place there, down through the channel, and uh, tried to bomb the concentrated the Japs, they were concentrated. If it hadn't been been for the first marine division we'd probably ended up in a japanese prison eating soy and rice <laughs> the marines were great they were the best well uh you uh was telling me about some of your living conditions down there on the island living conditions we lived underneath a great big tree it was the biggest tree i ever saw we didn't have tents we didn't have nothing and they had a they had a dump where the uh, where they were bringing the rations in a great big place, and if you wanted something to eat, you went out and got it for quite some time. After about three or four or five months, they got a halfway uh, <laughs> dining room, <laughs> if you want to call it that. Every time you'd take a bite of something, the flies and the mosquitoes would get the rest of it, and the worst of it, it was horrible living. The dengue fever. Our doctors didn't know anything about it, and I was one of the first ones to get it. But it was just like malaria, so uh, they treated me, and I came back to work, and that was it. Okay, so you stayed in the islands, and then you were sent back to Hickam Field. Then we came thought. back to Hickam Field, mm -hmm. and our people came back to uh, get uh, started for the B-29s, where they were in the process of building B-29s down here, Bell Aircraft. 
and a number of other places. So our crews came back for the uh, uh, for, to get take a leave of absence, like, and then get ready for the uh, B-29s. I see. So you uh, continued on into the U uh, until the U.S. Air Force came into being, and the Army Air Corps kind of faded into the that was in, background. That was in 1947. We became integrated. We mm -hmm. were never integrated before. And on this island, on the island that I was on, Santos, they had a uh, an engineer company, a black engineer company, and the commanding officer that was from my hometown, his name was Al Montoro. He was a captain, and I hadn't seen him for a long time, but he was, lived about, uh, they were stationed about five miles from where we were, and uh, I made it up there to, to eat with him a lot because they had good food and uh, considering everything, and he worked those people 18 hours a day, so there was no problem of getting into any trouble with it. <laughs> we didn't have any trouble. Right, right, right. And they, they finally ended up built the runway, and then the Seabees came in and, and, and uh, finished it. So you continued on, and then you retired, I think, out of the uh, U.S. Air Force. I retired in year? November the 30th, 1960. 1960, and I yep. believe you uh, love to play golf. Oh Lord, one, yes. one of your passions, I think. Yeah, the golf was my the golf was my friend. Friend, <laughs> yeah. Well, time. I started caddying in 1926 at Coatesville, the Coatesville Air uh, Country Club. We got 55 cents for 18 holes. And they had a leather thin strap bag, and some of those jokers had about 20 clubs in them. And brother, when you got through, you earned that 55 cents. And if you oh. behave pretty good, you might get a quarter tip. Right. Do you have any other stories of what you would like to relate of some of your experiences? Well, I had a lot of experiences. Some of them I can't. I'm sure relate. you did with that kind of. Uh, uh, of time. When I was stationed in, te in Texas, we went to the bullfights uh, quite a bit. We went down to uh, uh, Nuevo Laredo and we went down to Monterey. Mm -hmm. That was about 150 miles down the line. And uh, we'd get in the sunny side because that was cheap, the bullfight. And then we started yelling, Bravo El Toro. And then the cops came up and wanted to throw us in jail. And so we had to keep keep our mouths shut or else go to jail. So we didn't, didn't want to go to jail, so we kept quiet. I don't think I would have wanted to go to jail <laughs> in Mexico either. Okay. Well, Gene, thank you very much for well, your you're... service to this country. <laughs> okay, and you've John. got another special day coming up, I think, uh, September the 21st. Yeah. You'll be... Uh, I'll be 90, nine, 90 years 90 old. 90 years old. If the good Lord lets me go. Well, you're doing you're doing very well. And uh, so we appreciate it very much and appreciate your well, service to the I, country. I hope I contributed <laughs> for you. Okay.